Special thanks to Horizon Therapeutics for sponsoring the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast, working tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics mission at horizontherapeutics.com. I also want to say that to other parents who are new to this diagnosis is that it gets easier. It really gets easier because you love your child every day more. Every day more, he proves that regardless of his diagnosis, he still is he and he has his own moves and his own approaches to show how he loves you. And that's why you start looking at the, the diagnosis and him differently. That's our guest this week, Bella Milosevic, a mother to two-year-old Ivan who was diagnosed with CTNNB1, a rare disorder. Spella also founded the CTNNB1 Foundation to help find a cure for this debilitating syndrome. We'll hear Spella's story and much more on this special Father's Network Dad to Dad podcast. Say hello now to host David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs, presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. Now let's listen in on this special conversation between Spella Milosevic and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Spella Milosevic of Lubijan, Slovenia, who is the mother of two young children and founder of the CTNNB1 Foundation. Spella, thank you for taking the time to do an interview for the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Thank you, David, for having me. It's truly an honor to be here. You and your husband, Samo, have been married for three years and are the proud parents of two children, Eva, three, and Urban, two, who was diagnosed with CTNNB1, a rare autosomal genetic disorder that affects an estimated one out of 50,000 children worldwide. Hmm. Let's start with some background. Tell me something about your family. Okay, so I was born in Ljubljana. I had one older brother. He's eight years older. And I have a twin brother. So I was part of the twin in the family. And a mom and a dad. They're all lawyers, including my aunts and my grandparents. So I was born in a family where it is supposed to be everything justice. You know, everything needed to be split on halves. And there were a lot of conversations about things that happened on court. And they were really interesting conversations. And it was, it was actually very nice to have a twin brother because you can experience everything in a pair. So it was very funny to fool parents around and to have always someone to play with. And also I had a 80, I have a eight year older brother who was there, but the age gap was so big that I don't really remember so well having him around. So that's why my wish when I have a baby was that this gap wouldn't be too big. And I have a father and a mother my mother is a very kind, a very energetic woman. When we were young, she was working full time. She was building a house, like having meetings with architects and constructions, and she would take all her kids with her. And when she came home, she would cook and clean. And if the light went out or in, if anything in the house went down, she would be one, the one who took care of everything, including us and every night she would cuddle us and read us the story and teach us after the school like she was everything to us and to the house and she was really well stated in the work she was right before the ceo of the really big company i'm really 
excited about what kind of mother I have. And at the same time, I already feel pain that I know one day she won't be here. And that's why every day I want to take advantage to spend as it would be our last day. Love her really, really, really a lot. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. Um, it sounds like your mother's had a very influential role in your life and what a great role model that she is for you as a young mom yourself. Yeah, she is. And she sounds like a superwoman, right? What we think of as superwoman. So uh, I think you mentioned that your dad is a lawyer. What type of law did he practice? Hmm. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, he, did, he wasn't involved in the criminal law. But although sometimes he also took some, some of those cases, in Slovenia it's really, um, it's I think a bit different because um, most of the lawyers, they're not just specific on one area, but they cover many areas because Slovenia is really small. So he, um, I think he was uh, a lot involved in the insurance uh, issues and also in the family areas, which is really interesting because uh, I don't think he liked people that much, <laughs> but <laughs> he was listening to a lot of divorce stories and uh, relationship um, conflicts during his career. Yeah, I think the main, the main area were the, the divorces um, and uh, the insurance um, issues. Okay. So uh, how would you describe your relationship with your dad? Yeah, my relationship with my father is right now just the way it's supposed to be based on how we are today, what kind of persons we are. He was actually my role model when I was a young girl. He is very confident. He has an amazing authority. Everyone are afraid of him, <laughs> including the judge on the court. <laughs> uh, like he said, when there is a pause, he said that now he will go home and eat and like everybody listen to him. Uh, really, I'm not over exaggerating. He has an amazing authority and he's a very good looking guy. And um, he's just like, you know, when I was a little girl, I think I was in love with him like every young girl is in his father. And then I started changing. I started becoming a young uh, woman. And um, I also had a lot of issues with my skin. And I wasn't the little innocent woman anymore. And I think he had a hard time accepting this, the change um, that his daughter has became. And so I felt that he wasn't really accepting me anymore and he kind of broke my heart with some of the statements. And that's why I went um, to, to seek for attention in other guys. Um, and that's where we had even more of the conflict. conflict. And uh, that was during the, the time of my puberty. I don't think we had really any a genuine relationship. There were a lot of conflicts, but after some time, I think mainly now or the last five, six years, we kind of find uh, a language, find a way how we can, how we can be in a relationship where we both have what we need from that relationship. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing and thank you for your authenticity. It's one of your superpowers. When you think about your dad, was there an important lesson or two that you learned that you've tried to incorporate into being a parent yourself? I, I really like his honesty and his integrity. He's really, really, really an honest person. Like he would rather be in conflict. He would rather be in conflict with a knife than not be honest or genuine. And I think what I've learned from him is that also you know, sometimes with kids, it's easier to say something that's not true to make things a little easier. But I think he taught me to, you know, be honest, stay, uh, be the authority that the kids need. And I think this is something that I have from him to be stable to for my kids. Yeah, well, if I can paraphrase what you said, honesty and integrity, very high values that he has. And... It sounds like 
what you're referring to is just being real, mm. right? Dealing with reality as opposed to maybe hearing what you want to hear. You know, that's not always easy. So thank you for sharing. Mm. So from an educational standpoint, you have an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in biopsychology. And then you also have a PhD in public health. I'm actually, I have two bachelor degrees and two master degrees and I'm doing a PhD. I, I, I hope I'll, I'll, I'll be able to complete it in May 2020. Um, but I have a bachelor degree from biopsychology and a bachelor degree from psychotherapy. And I'm finishing my master degree from psychotherapy and I have finished a master degree in biopsychology and completing a PhD in public health, in biomedicine. You also mentioned that in your career that you've done some work in the field of cancer, and I'm wondering what type of work that is. Hmm. Yeah, I think my motivation came from my mother's family and also my mother. When I was in the puberty, my mother found that she had a cancer in, in breast cancer, and that was one of the hardest things that could happen to our family because she's she's like motor of our whole family. We we were very lucky because she had in situ cancer, which meant that the cancer hadn't come out from the from the breast, and she just had an operation, and she didn't even need the chemotherapy. However, that kind of got me think and to do some research on scientific articles, you know what are the possible psychosocial interventions that can help her to improve the life and maybe to decrease the survival. Because my mother, she's like a superwoman, but she doesn't take care of herself. She doesn't know how to express what she did, doesn't like. She don't know how to set the boundaries because always she said yes. She say yes to our family, to the people who are important to her. And so I was kind of wanting to know what is the relationship between emotion suppression, emotion repression and cancer progression or cancer survival. And when I was looking into that research, I got connected to David Spiegel. He's like the guy for this research, psychosocial interventions, psychotherapy and cancer survival. He actually published one study, it was in the 90s, where he had a supportive expressive group therapy and he had a control. And his group therapy showed that psychotherapy can improve survival. And that was kind of really important for me that with stress regulation and with the appropriate emotion regulation, you can actually have an impact on the even if the impact is small, but you can, you can have an impact on, on, the, on the cancer progression at least a little. And that gave me power to maybe help my mother, which was my goal from the beginning. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. One of the things that I became aware of through somebody who had done a lot of research, not a cancer researcher, but somebody who was an MIT trained scientist, was that stress the reduction of stress is something that, you know, is healthy, right? Because when we, when our bodies experience stress, whether it's chronic or occasional stress, it's not allowing our immune system to function in the way that it could or should. And it just creates more problems for whatever diagnosis you have, whether it's a cancer diagnosis or just being healthy. I know that there's more work to be done in this area, and I'm hoping that, you know, years down the road, we'll look back and say, well, duh, you know, why didn't we focus more on, you know, helping people reduce their stress and become healthier? So. Mm, yeah. So I'm sort of curious to know, how did you and Samo meet? <laughs> we actually met down the, we now live in Slovenska Cesta and right down below where we, where we live right now, there is a bar, kind of a club where we kind of bump into each other. I thought he was a really nice guy. And so we exchanged numbers and decided to meet next, next time. And the rest is history. 
No, no. <laughs> the, the next time he came onto our date, I was sure that I will never meet him again because he came onto our face first date in the trainer. Like, I don't think he even looked in the mirror. And he went for a pizza slide just before our meeting. So I, 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 I saw some of the pizza slides in his upper the lip, the mush, the, the yeah. mustache. Mustache. And so I was a little, you know, what's happening? I, I haven't experienced something like that before. So it was a really nice, interesting meeting someone who wasn't even had an idea that we were on a date. But yeah, after a while, he kept calling and calling and he was really persistent. And I think eventually I, I realized that his insight is much more beautiful than how he presented on the first site. Yeah, well, that's fabulous. Thank you for sharing. So let's talk about special needs first on a personal basis and then beyond. And I'm sort of curious to know before... Urban's diagnosis, did you or Samo have any exposure to the special needs community? Because I'm a psychologist or because I did some study in psychotherapy, I was actually working a few months at the special center with adults who have different syndromes or are developmentally delayed. It's kind of a day center for, for those adults. Mainly there are people with Down syndrome, but there were also some, now I know some other adults with genetic diseases or syndromes. And for me, it was when I was working with them, it was always on my mind. This something, having a child with a special need can't happen to me. I was like, this was so far from from the thought that it can happen to anyone. The novel mutations, which are from Down syndrome or the majority of the genetic autosomal dominant mutations can happen to anyone. And while it was a really fruitful and nice experience, after I stopped working with them, just the experience just passed away from me. I, I, I actually never came back to that. And I, I think Samo didn't prior to that didn't have any any experience with a, with a special need. Okay, so I'm sort of curious to know what is Urban's diagnosis and how did how was the diagnosis made? Hmm. So he has a CTNNB1 syndrome. The diagnosis means more than just a few words and numbers. It's supposed to be a severe progressive neurodevelopmental disorder. Progressive because some kids actually have a progressive spasticity in the hands and in the legs, meaning that their hands and legs get more stiff when they get older. However, this is not observed in all of the CTNNB1 kids. A story with us was kind of, I think, normal for what I hear from other parents that are going through. So the child, my child was born normally. He was 39 weeks and he was born like a normal and healthy baby. His Abgar score was almost perfect. 9, 10, 10. What more can you wish for? And he didn't have any weird bruises on his head, on his head when he was born. Um, he cried when he came out. Everything was perfect, normal, and we were over the moon. <laughs> um, and then the first things we noticed was his loose body and his inability to control his head. And then he had a medical consultation, his normal four months pediatric checkup. And as soon as the doctor looked at Urban, she was terrified. And she immediately said to me that he has a really strong dystonia. So this is a movement disorder. 
and that she thinks that something is seriously very wrong with him. And hearing that stories, looking at your healthy child was a, a, a big shock to me. I think I wasn't even able to process what she said. I don't know how I felt, but I just felt it was like a big shock. And she immediately sent us to screening of the head, the ultrasound of the head. And I also remember when we were leaving her room, there was another girl who apparently observed his weird movements. And I will never forget that, she, that this little girl, she said to her mommy, what is wrong with this boy? Mm. And that words hit me directly to my heart and it broke my heart to pieces because she saw that something is wrong with my boy, my perfectly healthy little boy. And everybody heard that in the room and looked at my boy and me not knowing that something is wrong. And that was, I think, the bottom of my experience from the beginning of this, of the diagnostic odyssey. And then we went to one physiotherapy to another physiotherapy. We were working with him nonstop and he got better. He got tougher. His movements were dystonia improved. And so we were again back to just a minor brain injury. And then during the quarantine, the 14 days quarantine, we again received the phone call first from my mother saying that she had the cancer came back and that this time is not just in situ that she will need a chemotherapy and that my father was diagnosed with a lung cancer and also which later on was found to be just a really bad infection of the lungs and another phone call from the from Urban's neurologist saying that they did find what is wrong with him and that he has this mutation typo in his genome on the very important gene called CTNNB1. And that was that was that was it for me in that moment. Wow. It sounds like it's been quite a journey. And he's still young he's only two years old so what would you be able to expect or what would any parent with that type of diagnosis be able to expect their child to be able to do or not do as he or she gets a little bit older with a ctnnb1 diagnosis so when we first got urban's diagnosis he was actually doing much better than he is now. We had really high hopes, even though we were in these Facebook groups and we were able to see how other kids are progressing or not progressing, how they don't speak or if they speak, they are not understandable. Um, we had high hopes because he looked normal. He had just a mild delay. Um, but now the more I'm into this, the more I see, the less I expect. And without a proper treatment, without a gene therapy treatment, I know I can't expect that he will be walking or talking or especially not being independent, which is, I think, something every parent with a special kid wants to hear. Yeah, well, that sounds like it would be very challenging. Like you said, you joined some Facebook groups, you're networking with other families who have a similar diagnosis. And if they have older children, you're sort of getting a preview, mm -hmm. right, of what to expect, whether they're verbal or nonverbal, whether they can walk or talk, or, you know, what is the likelihood that they're going to be able to live independently. Has there been some meaningful advice that you've gotten that's been useful? Yes, actually, there was one. And I want to, I also want to say that to other parents who are new to this diagnosis is that it gets easier. It really gets easier because you love your child every day more. Every day more, he proves that 
regardless of his diagnosis, he still is he and he has his own moves and his own approaches to show how he loves you. And that's why you start looking at the, the, the diagnosis and him differently. Yeah, well, I think the way I hear you phrasing it is that you've accepted him, mm. but not the diagnosis itself. Exactly, yeah. Right, and that's what has been your rocket fuel for doing something. Exactly, yeah. Not to focus on the negative, but what have been some of the bigger challenges that you and Samo have experienced? For me, before we had the diagnosis, one of the hardest things was the environment. I think I was kind of the only one who saw that maybe it's not just a minor brain injury and that maybe he won't recover as we think he will. So I didn't really have the support that maybe I needed it. Everybody were just saying, be positive and he will get better. And kind of a, I was always, okay, I will believe that I will be there. But then it came the moment when he wasn't progressing as the way I wanted or the way it was expected. So that was kind of a struggle also between me and Samo because we, we didn't kind of find the language how to, you know, how to talk about something that we don't know. So not having the diagnosis, it's, I think, one of the hardest things. And we didn't have to wait that long. It was nine months. But still, I think this, this was one of the most challenging things that I think of right now. So after, after we had a diagnosis, yes, it, it was very hard. It was very difficult, but at least we had something to work on. We had something on which we could talk about. We can, we could cry. We could grieve about him not being able to walk and talk and us as a family, not being able to do the normal things. So after after we had this, we can do our grieving process and slowly moving towards accepting Urban, our family as a whole, and moving forward with this. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. And I'm wondering what supporting organizations have you benefited from? I know the journey is a relatively short one, but what organizations come to mind that have been useful in your situation? I actually don't remember that I kind of approached to any organization except to the one we have in our own community. I remember finding about Effie Park's uh, episodes. So the podcast she had that was very important to me because I think she's amazing <laughs> and I love her voice and she talks about stuff that are important for the rare disease patients. So that was not on an organization, but some kind of support that I could turn to. And also we had two organizations in our CTNNB1 community. One is focused on the research and the other is focused on the awareness. So we have those things, but for me, it wasn't really very helpful because I couldn't do anything with with those two things, maybe just find some information. So I'm sort of curious to know what role of spirituality has played in your life. Mm. I think I'm a very curious person. And since I was a little girl, I had a lot of questions. And I also see that right now in my young, in my little girl, Eva. So I always wanted to know about relationships. And I was also very interested when someone died. I know we had a lot of deaths in my mother's family and the death from my grandfather especially touched me. And I was kind of uh, asking and trying to understand where do people go after they die and why do people? And I felt from young age that that's so unfair that, you know, people leave. And after after the puberty, I came across the mindfulness and I did a lot of, a lot of the mindfulness practice. I also did a, a mindfulness-based stress reduction program and even founded the mindfulness-based institution in Slovenia. 
uh, was one of the founders of this program. And now I'm teaching cancer patients mindfulness during the program of rehab cancer rehabilitation. So I think this part of me is, I, I think it's something that's part of me and something I need to nurture something that keeps me grounded and also kind of reminds me to take care of myself, especially because in this quick rhythm of life, you can get so easily lost. And if you, if I am aware of my spirituality and my own thoughts and body and how I'm feeling, it's easier to, to keep sane <laughs> and to kind of always question where are you now where are you going to be aware of the limited time you have here on earth i think this is so important not just for yourself and for you know really really take advantage of this short life you have here on earth but also for the relationships you have with others for example, with my mother, I know I said this already, but I just want to, I just want to really spend time, quality time with her and also with other people who are important to me to be aware that we are not here forever. Also for some other, for stupid conflicts that may came across, you know, just saying it's not, this is not important. And having that in mind and being aware of this, it's, I think it's making my life and my relationships easier. Okay, well, thank you for sharing a very thoughtful response. So let's talk about the CTNNB1 Foundation. What is the mission of that organization and how did it come about? That foundation was at first founded with a clear mission to cure my son. And it has a really nice and valuable side effects. That is, by treating my son, by finding a cure for my son, we can also cure 300 other kids with this syndrome and also every other generation of kids who have this syndrome. Um, so when I came to this CTNNB1 community, there were two, two, two organizations. Cure CTNNB1 and the CTNNB1 awareness. And I wanted to kind of include the gene therapy program in one of those organizations. However, we were unable to find a common language to do the inclusion. And also because for me, the collaboration is extremely important. So unfortunately, we weren't able to find that common language. So my, I needed to built another foundation to do my gene therapy programs and also to raise money because no money, no research. So I kind of did my own research in screening all of the CTNNB1 published cases that were reported in the literature. So after I had all these things in my hands and ready, I started to write down the researchers' names and the emails and the institutions, and then started slowly to approach them and asking them, hey, I have all these things ready. Can you please check and see if this approach is possible for our gene? And maybe if you can help us push this treatment forward. So how many researchers are involved in the CTNNB1 community? So right now we have six different gene therapy programs ongoing. The main institutes that are involved in these programs are the Children Medical Research Institute in Australia. So this is a very big institute that's focused on the rare CNS diseases. They have an amazing researcher called Dr. Leszek Lisowski that's focused on kind of doing the gene therapy for that specific brain genetic syndromes and Dr. Wendy Gold. So we have two uh, gene therapy programs there and we are also working with the Slovenian researchers. So at the National Institute of Chemistry and at the Pediatric Hospital in Slovenia 
who are also leading our natural history. So doing the interviews with the parents from kids all around the world that we will have a really good data of what are the symptoms our kids have, kind of a what is the relationship, genotype and phenotype relationship, which is needed to, to do prior to clinical trial that's hoping to come in the following year or two. And how many families have you been able to identify with the CTNNB1 diagnosis? So the thing is, we don't have the exact number because there is no official registry that would take in all of the kids. We have some approximate number, which is 300 kids based on how many kids are involved in this Facebook group. But we know that this syndrome was developed in 2012. So, you know, normally that there are a lot of more kids that have, an, that have been diagnosed with cerebral palsy because our syndrome was found to be the most common misdiagnosed syndrome. And also there are other kids who don't have the diagnosis, especially from the less developed countries who can't afford the genetic sequencing. So what's your vision for the foundation? So when I started this foundation, my vision was story oriented only towards Urban. I had a clear mind, you know, curing my son, get out, <laughs> give this foundation to anyone who needs it. Even if I, the foundation got some money from this, you know, maybe get some money from this gene therapy program, sell it to pharma, pharma and get some money and give this foundation to other people who are working on gene therapies for their own syndrome. Just get out and save my son. And now the more I'm involved in this, the more I feel that it's my responsibility, not just to cure Urban, but also to cure other kids and also find other cases in the less developed countries, get them in and also try to find the treatment and cure for them. So I, it's really interesting to feel that responsibility and to feel that, you know, maybe there is something on this that I, Urban was born for me. And now I have this special mission for which I'm, actually very grateful to have this role to be able to help also other kids with this syndrome. Yeah, well, what you refer to as a special mission is what I commonly think is a purpose, mm -hmm. right? It's become a calling of sorts, right, for you to pursue. Mm -hmm. From your lips to God's ears, I'm hoping that to be able to make steady progress and not perhaps only find a cure for a bond, but to make a big difference mm -hmm. in the lives of other children with a similar or the same diagnosis. Yeah. And one last question about the foundation. I'm sort of curious now, how are you funded? How is the foundation funded? I come from Slovenia. So Slovenia is a really small country. It's approximately 2 million people. But we are a very connected and I think the majority of people who live there are very kind, are very generous and after I funded my organization, I instantly went first to Slovenians. So I, I went also publicly with our story. And in only four months, we raised $700,000. Wow. I think that really tells a lot about how Slovenians are that when things are serious, and especially when it goes for a child, they will do anything they can to help other little Slovenians. Well, that's fabulous. Congratulations. A rather respectable amount of money. I'm wondering if there's any support for the foundation coming from the United States or other parts of the world for that matter. I put Urban Story to GoFundMe, also maybe to find some other donators who can help. We received some little donations from parents of CTNNB1, but nothing really something that would be significantly uh, important to the cause. Currently, I think we focused more on Europe and to the companies in Europe. And I think it's also a little different because our foundation is registered in Slovenia. And in United States, you have these special things like matching gifts 
and we don't have that in Slovenia. So it's a little different and a little harder maybe to get donations from United States. But I, I won't stop. <laughs> I will also try there. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. So I'm thinking about advice now, and I'm wondering what advice can you share with parents and specifically dads about helping raise a child that has differences? I think one of the most important things is to take care of yourself. I heard that actually from one psychologist before, and I think it's one of the best advices I could hear. And this is that you need to eat healthy, you need to be active, and you need to sleep well. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you will achieve all those three things at the same time, but you need to strive for those things. And I know from myself that if I'm rest, at, if I'm at rest, and if I think that I'm taking care of myself, it will be something more that I can give to my kids. Yeah, well, that's really good advice. The image that comes to mind is the message you get at the beginning of every airline's flight, which is in the case of an emergency and the masks come down, you need to put your own mask on first, right? And if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to be there for somebody else. And that's what I sort of heard you saying. Yeah, one of the dads in the network said, and I thought it was really profound, he said you need to be selfish before you can be selfless, right? Which is another way of saying you need to take care of yourself first before you can be selfless and be taking care of other people. So thank you for making that point. So is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? Yes, I want to thank you, David. I think what you're doing is truly amazing and inspiring. And I do feel very honored to be able to speak on your dad to dad podcast because I'm obviously a woman and it's really an, a big honor for me to, to be able to speak to you. And I think talking with you is really calming. And I think your, your kids are very privileged to, to be calling you a father. Yeah, well, thank you for those kind words. Let's give a special shout out to Effie Parks at the Once Upon a Gene podcast for helping connect us. Spella, thank you for taking the time and many insights. As a reminder, Spella is just one of the individuals who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concern. Would you please consider making a tax deductible contribution? I would really appreciate your support. Spella, thank you again. Thank you very much also for having me here. I really enjoyed it. If you'd like to find out more about Spella Milosevic and her work, go to ctnnb1-foundation.org. You can also email her at spella at ctnnb1-foundation.org. That website again is ctnnb1-foundation.org. Thanks for listening to this week's Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children match up with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support other dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to facebook.com groups and search dad to dad Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, please send an email to david at 21stCenturyDads.org. The Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast was produced by me, Tom Couch. Thanks again to Horizon Therapeutics, who believe that science and compassion must work together to transform lives. 
That's why they work tirelessly to research, develop, and bring forward medicines for people living with rare and rheumatic diseases. Discover more about Horizon Therapeutics at horizontherapeutics.com.